The Second Year, Part Three During the autumn and winter after, the shadow of a new bride at Swallowfield had vanished from Pat's sky. Life went on at Silverbush delightfully. It was a very cold winter, so cold that there was not only frost but feathers on the windows most of the time, and there was much snow and wild wind in birch and spruce, and never a thaw, not even in January, although Tillytuck was loath to give up hope of one. I've never seen a January without a thaw yet, and I've seen hundreds of them, he asserted, and wondered grumpily why everybody laughed. But he saw one that year. The cold continued unbroken. The stones around Judy's flower beds always wore white snow caps and looked like humpy little gnomes. Pat was glad the garden was covered up. It always hurt her to see her beautiful garden in winters when there was little snow, so forsaken looking, with mournful bare flower stalks sticking up out of the hard frozen earth and bare, writhing shrubs that you never could believe could be mounds of rosy blooms in June. It was nice to think of it sleeping under a spotless coverlet, dreaming of the time when the first daffodil would usher in spring's age of gold. And there was beauty, too, everywhere. Sometimes Pat thought the winter woods, with their white reserve and fearlessly displayed nakedness, seemed the rarest and finest of all. You never knew how beautiful a tree really was until you saw it leafless against a pearl-gray winter sky. And was there ever anything quite so perfect as the birch grove in a pale rose twilight after a fine, calm fall of snow? In the stormy evenings, Silverbush, snug and sheltered, holding love, laughed defiance through its lighted windows at the gray night full of driving snow. They all crowded into Judy's kitchen and ate apples and candy, while happy cats purred and a wheezy little dog, who, alas, was growing old and a bit deaf, snored at Pat's feet. Wild and weird, or gay and thrilling, were the tales told by Judy and Tillytuck in a rivalry that sometimes convulsed the Silverbush folks. Judy had taken to locating most of her yarns in Ireland, and when she told a gruesome tale of the man who had made a bargain with a bad man below and broke it, Tillytuck could not possibly claim to have known or been the man. What was the bargain, Judy? Oh, oh, it was for his wife's life. She was to live as long as he never prayed to God. But if he prayed to God, she would die, and he was to belong to old Satan for ever. Sure, and she lived for many a year. And then me fine man got a bit forgetful like. And one day, when the pig broke its leg, he says, says he, in a tragic tone, Oh, God, says he, and his wife did be dying that very night. But that wasn't a prayer, Judy. Oh, oh, but it was. When you cry on God like that, in any trouble, it do be a prayer. The bad man below knew it well. What became of the husband, Judy? Oh, oh, he was taken away, said Judy contriving to convey a suggestion of indescribable eeriness that sent a shiver down everybody's back. Satisfied with the effect, she remarked deprecatingly, But listen to me prattering of old days. I'd be better employed setting me bread. And while Judy set the bread, Tillytuck would spin a yarn of being chased by wolves one moonlit night while skating and told it so well that everyone shuddered pleasantly. But Judy said coldly, I did be read in that very story, Tillytuck, in Long Alec's old royal raider in me blue chest. I dare say you read something like it, retorted Tillytuck, unabashed. I never claimed to be the only man chased by wolves. Dwight Madison took to haunting Silverbush that winter, and it was quite plain that he had, as Sid said, a terrible ailment called serious intentions. Pat tried to snub him. 
Dwight wouldn't be snubbed. Never occurred to Dwight that any girl would want to snub him. Aunt Hazel was hot in his favor, but Judy, for a wonder, was not. He was too deadly serious, solemn, in earnest young man for Judy. "'Do you be calling that a bow?' she demanded after his first visit, in a tone that implied she would rather call it something the cats had brought in. Pat said she thought. He snored, and Cuddles remarked that he looked like spinach. After that there was no more to be said, and Long Alec, who rather favoured Dwight because he had prospects from a bachelor uncle, concluded that modern girls were hard to please. Aunt Hazel was quite cool to Pat for a time. Bold and bad, had pneumonia in March, but got over it, thanks, it was believed, to Tilly Tuck's ministrations. Tilly Tuck sat up with him two whole nights in the granary chamber, keeping him covered with blanket in a box by the open window. Twice during each night, Judy ploughed out to him through the snow to carry him a hot cup of tea and a little bite. Gentleman Tom did not have pneumonia, but he had a narrow escape of his own, which Judy related with gusto. Girls, dear, never did I be hearing of such a thing. You'll be remembering that when we had the rolled roast for dinner Sunday, I did be taking out the string afore I took it to the table, and throwing it into the wood box. Oh, oh, and this afternoon, when I come in, didn't gentleman Tom be sitting there be the stove, with something hanging from his mouth, like a rat's tail? When I looked closer, I saw it was a bit of string, and I took hold of it, and pulled it. It did be pulling out over a yard of it. The beast had swallowed it till he was full of it, and couldn't quite manage the last two inches, and it did be that saved his life, for never could he have digested it. But, girls dear, if you could have seen the look on his face when I was pulling at the string. And from this out, it's better than every row string at once I'll be doing, for we don't want any more of our cats committing suicide in that fashion. Another joke for you to write to Hillary, Pat said Cuddles slyly. But at last they were throwing open the windows to let in the spring, and Pat learned all over again how lovely young cherry trees were, waving whitely in green twilights, and the scent of apple blossoms in moonlight, and the colonies of blue grape hyacinths under the dining room windows. But there were some clouds on her horizon, no bigger than a man's hand, yet fraught with worrisome possibilities. She could not settle down in perfect peace, even after house-cleaning was, as Tilly Tuck said, all done, though not quite finished. There was a lick of paint to be administered here and there, some curtains to be mended, the early carrots to be thinned out, and dozens of delightful little things like that to be tended to. But ever and anon, what Hawthorne calls a dreary presentiment of impending change crept across her happiness like a hint of September coolness stealing athart the languor of an August afternoon. For one thing, trees were dying everywhere as a result of the bitter winter or because of some disease. The cross little spruce tree at the garden gate, which had grown up into a cross big tree, died and although Pat had liked it the least of all the trees, she grieved over its death. It was heart-rending to walk through the woods at the back and see a friend here and there turning brown or failing to leaf out. Even the huge spruce in happiness was dying, and one of Hillary's twin spires. For another thing, Judy was by now quite keen on going to Ireland for a visit in the fall. Pat hated the very thought, but she knew she must not be selfish and horrid. Judy had served Silverbush long and faithfully and deserved a holiday if anyone ever did. Pat choked down her dismay and talked encouragingly. Of course, Judy must go. There was nothing in the world to prevent her. Cuddles was going to try the entrance in July, and if she passed, would likely be away at Queen's next year but somebody could be got in to help Pat during Judy's absence. Judy would stay all winter, of course, 
it would not be worth going for less, and a winter crossing of the Atlantic was not advisable. The Atlantic? When Pat thought of the Atlantic rolling between her and Judy, she felt absolutely sick. But Cuddles was thrilled about it all. Thrilled, is it? said Judy, rather sourly. You'll be having thrills with a vengeance if old Mrs. Bob Robinson comes here in me place. She's the only one we can be getting, it seems. Oh, oh, what'll me poor kitchen be in her regime? But think of all the fun you'll have when you come back, putting it to rights, Judy. Oh, oh, you've got the right philosophy of it, agreed Judy, brightening up. Did I be telling you, I had a letter come from me cousin in Ireland today. They had been very curious about that letter. A letter for Judy was a phenomenon at Silverbush, and Judy had been curiously affected by it. If it had been possible for her to turn pale, she would have done so. She had taken the letter and stalked off to the graveyard to read it. All the rest of the day she had been strangely quiet. He sent her a scratch of me pin back a bit. I hadn't been hearing from her for over twenty years, and thinks I to myself, maybe she's dead, but at any rate I'll find out. And today along comes her answer, living and flourishing, and that glad to think of me visiting her, and me old Uncle Michael Plum, do be living yet, at ninety-five, and calling his son of seventy a saucy young felly whenever he contradicts him. It did be giving me a queer feeling, Patsy. I'm thinking I know what it's going to be like on the resurrection day, no less. Hillary is going across this month, said Pat. He has won the Bannister Scholarship and is going to spend the summer in France sketching French country houses. Pat did not tell them everything about the matter. She did not tell them that Hilary had asked her a certain question again. If she could answer it as he wished, he would spend the summer in P.E. Island instead of in France. But Pat was sure she couldn't answer it as he wished. She loved him so dearly as a friend, but that was all. I'm putting into this letter, she concluded, a little corner of the orchard. A young fir all overgrown with green tassel tips, that moonlight curve you remember in Jordan, a bit of wild plum spray, a wind that has blown over spice ferns, the purr of a little cat and the bark of a little dog who desires to be remembered to you, and always my best friendly love. Isn't that enough, Hilary, darling? Come home and enjoy these things, and let us have one more summer of our old jolly companionship. Her heart glowed with the thought of it. There never was such a chum and playfellow in the whole world as Hilary. But Hilary couldn't see it that way, and so he was going to France. Perhaps Hilary knew more about some things than Pat ever told him. Cuddles wrote to him occasionally and told him more of Pat's goings-on than Pat ever dreamed of. Hilary knew of all the would-bees who came to Silverbush, and it may be that Cuddles colored her accounts a trifle highly. Certainly, Hilary somehow got the impression that Pat had developed into a notable flirt, with no end of desperate lovers at her feet. Even when Cuddles wrote about Dwight Madison, she did not mention his goggling eyes or the fact that he was an agent on commission for farm implements. Instead, she said, he was president of the young man's Bible class, and that Dad thought him a very sensible young man who would have oodles of money when his bachelor uncle died. If it had not been for that dramatic episode of Cuddles, who honestly thought she was doing Pat a good turn by trying to make Hillary jealous, Hillary might have come to the island that summer after all. He was too used to being turned down by Pat as a lover to be discouraged by that alone. Then there was the rumor that Sid was engaged to Dorothy Milton. Jealousy went through Pat like a needle whenever she heard it. Vainly she tried to comfort herself by thinking that, at any rate, Sid could not marry until the other place was paid for and a new house built on it. The old house had been torn down and the lumber in it used to build a new stable. Pat had felt sad over that, too, 
It had been Hillary's home, and they had signaled back and forth on cool blue summer nights. As for Dorothy Milton, she was a nice girl, undoubtedly, and would be a very suitable wife for Sid if he had to marry some day. Pat told herself this a hundred times, without making much impression on something that would not be reconciled. She was hurt, too, that, if it were true, Sid had not told her. They were such chums in everything else. He consulted her in everything else. Sid was taking over the running of the farm more and more, as long Alec devoted himself to stock-raising on the other place. Every Sunday evening, Pat and Sid would walk over the entire farm and note the crops and fences and plan for the future. It was Sid's ambition to make Silverbush the best farm in North Glen, and Pat was with him heart and soul. If only things could go on forever like this. When Pat read her Bible chapter one night, she found the verse, Meddle not with them that are given to change, and underscored it three times. Solomon, she felt, had gone to the root of things. Cuddles was another of Pat's problems, or rather, Ray, as she must henceforth be called. On her birthday she had gathered all the family around her, and told them without circumlocution that they were not to call her Cuddles any more. She would simply not take notice of anything that was said to her unless she was called Ray. And she stuck to it. It was hard at first. They all hated to give up the dear, absurd old name that was linked with so many sweet memories of Cuddles when she was an adorable baby, when she was a new schoolgirl, when she was in her arms and legs stage, when she was just stepping daintily into her teens. But Cuddles stood to her guns, and they got into the new habit sooner than they would have thought possible. All except Judy. Judy did try her best, but she could never do better than could Ray, which was so ridiculous that Ray eventually yielded a point and let Judy revert to the old name. The Silverbush folks had suspected for some time that Ray was going to be the beauty of the family, and at last they were sure of it. Martin Madison, who had three ugly daughters, said contemptuously that Ray Gardner was only two dimples and a smile. But there was more to her than that. Tillytuck considered that he had put it in a nutshell when he said she had all the other North Glen girls skinned a mile. There were some glamour about her that they didn't have. She really had a head full of brains and talked of being a doctor, more to horrify Judy than anything else, since she had really no special hankering for a career. She was clever enough to conceal her cleverness, especially from the youths who began to come to Silverbush, boys of the generation after Pat, whom they regarded as quite elderly. Ray was very popular with them. She had a come-and-find-out air about her that intrigued them, and she had practiced a faraway, mysterious smile so faithfully before her mirror that it drove them quite crazy guessing what she was thinking of. None of them interested her at all, not being the least like the pictures of the movie stars she kept pinned on her walls at the head of her bed, but she coolly told Pat, they would do for getting your hand in. Ray was full of life, her every step was a dance, her every gesture full of grace and virility. She went about looking for thrills and always found them. Pat, looking at the exquisite oval of her little unwritten face, sighed and wondered what life had for this dear sister. She was far more worried over Ray's future than her own, and mothered her to what Ray considered an absurd degree. It was provoking, when you were feeling romantic and ethereal, to be cautioned to put on your overshoes, and to be told you were a snob because you complained of Tillytuck saying queer things in the kitchen when you were entertaining a Charlottetown boy and his sister in the little parlour. "'I'm not a snob, Pat. You know very well Tilly Tuck is always saying odd things. Of course, they're great fun, and we laugh at them, but strangers don't understand. And that little parlor door won't stay shut. 
I'll never forget the look on Jerry Arnold's face last night when he heard Judy and Tilly talk in one of their arguments. Ray came to an end of breath and italics, which gave Pat a chance to say bitingly, Jerry Arnold's father was junk man twenty years ago. Who is being the snob now? retorted Ray. Jerry is going to have money. Oh, you needn't look at me like that, Pat. I've no notion of ever marrying Jerry Arnold. He isn't my style. Was this? Could this be little Cuddles, who was a baby day before yesterday? But when I do marry, I'm going to marry a rich man. I admit I'm worldly. I like money. And you know, Pat, we've never had quite enough of that at Silverbush. But think of the other things we've had, said Pat softly. Ray, sweet, absurd little Ray, was not to be taken too seriously. Not much money, I admit, but everything else that matters. And besides, we've always got tomorrow. That sounds very fine, but what does it mean? Ray had taken up a pose of being hard-boiled this spring. No, my Patricia, one has to be practical in this kind of a world. I've thought it all over carefully, and I've decided that I'll marry money and have a good time the rest of my life. Have you anyone in mind? inquired Pat sarcastically. Ray's blue, black-lashed eyes filled with laughter. No, darling, there's really plenty of time. Though Trix Binney is married. Married at seventeen, just think of it. Only two years older than I am. Her face while she was being married was simply a scream. Jerry Arnold says she looked exactly like a kitten that had caught its first mouse. Well, we had an excellent view of May's shoulder blades for the space of a quarter of an hour said Pat, who had been so furious over the Bennys presuming to invite the gardeners to the wedding that it took Ray a whole evening to persuade her to go to the church. "'Those raw-boned girls certainly shouldn't wear backless dresses,' said Ray, with a commonplace glance over her own shoulder. Trix really didn't care a bit for Nell's Royce, but when she failed in the entrance last year there was really nothing else for her. It was so funny to hear Mrs. Binney pretending Trix wouldn't have gone to Queen's even if she had passed. I wouldn't have Trix teaching school. I ain't going to have my daughter slave to the public. Pat howled. Ray's mimicry of Mrs. Binney was inimitable. I'm sure May is furious because Trix is married before her, continued Ray. I suppose she has finally given up hope of Sid, now that he is really engaged to Dorothy Milton. Do you suppose he really is? asked Pat. Oh, yes. She's got her ring. I noticed it last night at choir practice. I wonder when they'll be married. Pat shivered. She suddenly felt like a very small cat in a very big world. The gold was fading out of the evening sky. A great white moth flew in by the dusk. The spruce wood on the hill had turned black. The moon was rising over the hill of the mist. Far down, the sea shivered in silver ecstasy. Everything was beautiful, but there was something in the air. Another chill of change. Ray had suddenly grown up, and Sid belonged to them no longer. Then. One of her April changes came over her. After all, the world was full of June, and Silverbush was still the same. She sprang up. It's a waste of time to go to bed too early on a moonlit night. And all the wealth of June is ours, no matter how poor we may be, according to your worldly standards, darling. Let's get out the car and run over to Winnie's. Pat had learned to run the car that spring. Judy had been much upset about it, and talked gloomily of a girl at the bridge who had tried to run her father's car, put her foot on the accelerator instead of the brake, and had gone clean through a haystack. Or so Judy had heard. Pat managed to acquire the knack without any such disaster. 
although Tillytuck averred that on one occasion he saved his life only by jumping over the doghouse. And Judy still came out in gooseflesh when she saw Pat backing the car out of the garage. Times do be changed, she remarked to Gentleman Tom. Here's Patsy and Cuddles dashing off in the car when they should be thinking of their bed. Cat dear, is it that I do be getting old when I can't be getting used to it? Gentleman Tom put a leg rather stiffly over his shoulder. Perhaps he too felt that he was getting old. <laughs>